to uh, another lecture which is about the development of the nervous uh, system and in this lecture I will uh, talk just about the um, uh, the introduction to the development of the nervous system and to the development of the brain and the brain stem while in the next lecture it would be about the development of the spinal cord so um, let us start with a couple of slides just to uh, uh, give you the basics of the uh, development of the nervous system in which I think before the nervous system you remember at the beginning of the third week we have uh, 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 three germ uh, cell layers developed uh, at that time in which you know them uh, uh, as or they known as um, ectoderm outside and here is the cross-section uh, from the uh, imperio. See here is the ectoderm in blue color and you have mesoderm and you have the most inner germ layer which is the endoderm. But in the nervous system mainly we'll gi we will give extra focus on the uh, uh, ectoderm in which the nervous system my friends uh, start uh, by uh, uh, the ectoderm in which look at the uh, dorsal midline ectoderm here in which it started as you see like a thickening if you compared it to the periphery so in the middle of the pack um, here the ectoderm started to thickening and this thickening start to twist like in this shape in which to form a neural plate. This thickening forms something called neural plate. Now, the edge of the, or the margin of the neural plate becomes like elevated like that, right? In which they create something called fold, which is like the fold of a paper, fold whatever. So this is the neural fold. Once the neural fold formed, these folds start to approach each other. That means approximating each other, become closer to each other until they fuse like that, forming like a tube. This is the neural tube. So my friends, you started with the plate. There is a thickening of that plate. Then the edge of the plate started to twist like that to form folds. These folds start to approximate each other until they, until they close and form something called uh, neural tube. Neural tube is very important. Now we'll talk more about it. But here is guys one thing I would like, let me show you, here is the first one in which this is the uh, uh, midline dorsum of ectoderm start to thickening. Look at it, it becomes like a more than a layer. Then there's something called from neural plate. This plate, the edge of these plates start like to approximate uh, and elevate it and approximate each other to form neural folds. So, although they uh, indicated to this, but most, you know, uh, I, I think we have to correct it and say this is the folds, neural folds. These neural folds approximate each other until they form something called neural tube. It's like a tube, right? So, the neural tube will give the development of the brain and the spinal cord. But look, the edge of the, um, uh, for what we call it, or the, the lateral margin of a neural plate that's in a blue color here, will not, they are not incorporated in the neural tube because they will form something called a neural crest. Look at it here this one and this one. So the edge or the margins of the neural plate, they will not incorporate in the formation of a neural tube, but uh, instead they will be separated and uh, uh, shown like uh, these structures called uh, a neural um, uh, crest, right? These are neural crest. So the development of the neural tube started at the middle of the third week and it ends in the middle of fourth week which is easy to remember so the formation of neural tube completed by 
middle of fourth week. Anything related to this word, neural tube, you have to memorize it like your name, which is very important. Now, yes, again to neural tube, uh, which is important. Here, guys, you are looking to the dorsal view of Imperio at about the uh, third to fourth week of development. So in which the time that the neural tube formed, in which if you look at it, you will see that this tube, neural tube, and we look at here, has two openings, right? One superior and one is inferior. We call it caudal neuropore and rostral neuropore, right? So these two openings will communicate freely with the amniotic cavity and amniotic fluid here. But this will not last for a long time. Here is again a lateral view of Imperio at the fourth week. Still the rost, the, uh, uh, you can see here the rostral neuropore and the caudal neuropore. But you have to know, which is very important, that the rostral neuropore would close earlier than the um, caudal neuropore, in which it closed as at 25 days of age of imperio, while the caudal neuropore would close later after two days, that means as at 27 days, which is important. Now, look at the neural tube here, my friends. So, the we can divide it into one upper one third of a um, uh, neural tube and the lower one third of a neural tube in which the upper one third will give the development of the future brain which is very important and the caudal one will give the of course if this is the brain region that means this will give the spinal cord right so let us again back to neural tube, which is very important. That will give the uh, development of the brain and spinal cord. Let us take a cross section of it. You know, this is the, you can see we take a cross section from neural tube and the missing chyme around it, the uh, light blue color here also. So mainly it's composed from a neuroectoderm, this one, and missing chymal cells here. So if you look to the neuroectoderm, you have to know that the neuroectoderm will give the neurons at the end and most of uh, glial cells, and in this case, uh, we talk about the astrocyte and oligodendroplast um, uh, and, of course, oligodendrocyte, and also it gives the ebendimal cells that lines the um, cavities of the brain like lateral ventricle, third ventricle, fourth ventricle and so forth. So the neuroectoderm um, gives axons, uh, sorry, neurons and most of the glial cells including astrocyte, oligodendrocyte and ebendimal cells. But what about the um, last type of glial cells in the brain which is the microglia cell. Guys, I would just remind you that Schwann cells, something related to the peripheral nervous system, right? Forget it now. So I'm talking about the central. So the microglia cell, guys, originates from missing chymal, uh, missing chymal cells uh, here, as you see, right? So uh, let us start again with the neural tube development. First of all, the neural tube gives three primary physicals. Physicals, that means uh, something dilated, right? So this is again, the you look into the neural, the whole neural tube, and we mentioned that the upper one third is the primordium of the um, brain, while the lower two third will give the uh, spinal cord. Let us, uh, uh, the caudal part, I mean, gives the uh, spinal cord. So let us have a look to the, take a, um, a maximize or zoom in in the brain physical. 
here we call it brain vesicle and this is the part that gives spinal cord however let us focus on the brain vesicle and maximize it or zoom in in it you will see that the brain vesicle this area gives three dilations three vesicles so the from superior to inferior they are the first one which is would be the for brain let me use these names now and the middle one is the middle brain and the inferior one is the hind brain but in another way we can say um let me use this okay in another way we can say okay we have prosencephalon or i mean for brain and missing cephalon and rompin cephalon you have to know these terms right so because do you remember the brain and brain stem of course yes brain stem composed from midbrain pons and middle blangata and here you have the cerebrum so this is the cerebrum and diencephalon uh, for a brain say and the missing cephalon the midbrain here is this one and thrombocephalon or hindbrain will give the pons and middle blancata but let us wait this slide is very important right because again it gives you the basic of the development of primary physical so the brain physical has three primary we call them th primary vesicles right you have again prosencephalon mesencephalon and rompencephalon but these primary vesicles will give not all of them of course the first and the last one will give uh, two each one will give two secondary vesicles start with the forebrain or prosencephalon prosencephalon well dilated and we'll talk more about these but let us make it just a brief introduction so the prosencephalon will give telencephalon and diencephalon that means the cerebrum and between the two cerebral hemispheres you have a diencephalon which is here and midbrain the most important thing which is easier to remember that the midbrain will not change will not give anything else so midbrain will stay Mesencephalon, yes, will stay mesencephalon. So it will give the midbrain. Now, the hindbrain or rompencephalon will give the metencephalon and myelencephalon. M, M. Yes, we have another M, but we know, we agree that the midbrain will not change. Mesencephalon, stay mesencephalon. So the last two things is M, M, metencephalon, myelencephalon. So, back again to the telencephalon. Telencephalon will give the cerebral hemispheres. And diencephalon, you know the diencephalon, thalamus, hypothalamus, epithalamus, and so forth. Mesencephalon stay mid the brain. And metencephalon will give again pons and cerebellum. Yes, what we have else, other than the part from brainstem, we have the myelencephalon that will give the medulla blancata and most importantly also to know the ventricles i think already because you talk already the uh, gross anatomy of the brain so you can easily say yes cerebral hemispheres what would be the cavity here to be the lateral ventricles and here you have guys th uh, the diencephalon you have thalamus here thalamus here so this space is the third ventricle Moving to the midbrain through a cerebral aqueduct. So this is the cavity here. And moving from cerebral from third, because this is the third ventricle, right? So cerebral aqueduct in the midbrain, you will get to the fourth ventricle, upper part and lower part. So here the upper part of the fourth ventricle, lower part of the fourth ventricle. So this slide is very important. Now because we said that the neural tube started to develop between the middle of the third week and complete by the middle of the fourth week back again to the fourth week of imperio 
And do you know that the nervous system, especially neural tube, grows fast and rapidly? And because of that, it becomes like bended like this. Look at the bend that happens because of fast development. But look at the head, head like twisted here, um, uh, frontally and dorsally, right? Because of this rapid grow, so the uh, of the imperio and development of the nervous system there, the what we will see is a kind of angles or flexures. These flexures um, located at some places, we have mainly three. Let me remind you with these vesicles, right? Again, you have the forebrain and you have um, uh, um, uh, or let us uh, say uh, prosencephalon or for a brain here is the mid brain or mesencephalon and you have hind um, a brain or rhombencephalon yes and this is the spinal cord after this dash line excellent so look at let me raise these things now and say at the mid brain or mesencephalon you have a flexure here we call it Midbrain flexure or cephalic flexure. This is the first one, which is in the region of the midbrain. You have another flexure, which is between the hind brain and the spinal cord. You know the hind brain is the last part of the stem. That means between the brain stem and the spinal cord. Remember that, which is now it's called cervical flexure. Cervical flexure. Now those ventrally right but there is another one will develop called bontine flexure here at the back of the uh, hind brain opposite of course to the cephalic and cervical flexures it's called pont uh, bontine uh, flexure you can say pontine and some people like pronounce it pontine uh, so mostly they use pontine, although I like pontine, but anyway. So this is a pontine flexure. You see it here, which is somebody can say, where is that? Yes, you'd, I would like to show you where is it. Because of, look at the uh, part of hind the brain or rhombencephalon. It's like twisted to the front. Look at the row, twisted anteriorly, pushed anteriorly. But it leaves it something behind it which is a create something of kind a ventricle here, which is the fourth ventricle. Because here, guys, you will get the pons and medulla oblongata and the cerebellum here. And, you know, this space is the fourth ventricle. Anyway, this is the pontine flexure, but this is the cephalic flexure and this is the cervical flexure. Uh, I think you remember from the um, uh, previous slides about the brain vesicles that I'm indicating here. I will start with this one, which is the rostral one that we know as forebrain or prosencephalon. And we mentioned that the prosencephalon, which is the one of the primary vesicles there, will give the telencephalon, right? Will give the telencephalon and diencephalon. Now, you have to know that the uh, Telencephalon will give the two cerebral hemispheres, right? Two cerebral, I will change the color. So, two cerebral hemispheres. This is the uh, telencephalon. And the diencephalon, that will give, of course, the diencephalon. Now, what about the cavities? I'm iterating the cavities. Here is the cerebral hemispheres, and you know the lateral ventricles there. And you know the diencephalon in the, between the two cerebral hemispheres, and there is a third ventricle. If you remember from the lecture of gross um, anatomy of the brain, so the two lateral ventricles communicate with the um, third ventricle through uh, foramina. We know it, known as interventricular foramina or foramina of Monroe. The scientists who discovered those foramina. So, this is just an uh, introduction. Now, let me iterate again that the two cerebral hemispheres will develop from telencephalon, right? From telencephalon. Now, 
and say um, at about 32 days or say about um, a fourth week or fifth week of development the uh, cerebral hemispheres um, become like a bubble like outgrowth they grow and they take this you are looking to the lateral side of the uh, imperio and this is the um, cerebral hemisphere the will will become the cerebral hemisphere of course pupiled out growth out and later like with development at 16 week a 16 uh, week of development the cerebral hemispheres become like larger and oval they increase in size, become oval in shape and almost they cover the diencephalon look at the diencephalon above it's like exposed but here after development it becomes between the two cerebral hemispheres that means you have a cerebral hemisphere here and there and here is the diencephalon hidden so you look into it from here right now and after like further development look the cerebral hemisphere here and the cerebral hemisphere on the other side and the diencephalon uh, started to appear or shown here uh, become like um, obvious and the walls of the cerebral hemispheres become like thinner and thinner creating a kind of uh, make a space for uh, ventricles and you will start to see a choroid plexus we'll talk about it and here's the cavity of the lateral uh, ventricles one on the right and one on the left so the idea that the cerebrum like started as a purple increased becomes uh, like oval in shape diencephalon hidden now the cave start to uh, if it's correct to say the cavitation like it becomes like there's a cavity inside it and this cavity will be the lateral ventricle then choroid plexus start to appear there now i will skip this and I would like to say something else. You remember the cerebral cortex that full of cell bodies of neurons. Well, just I would like to say that um, the development um, proceeds most of nerve cells in the mantle. There is a mantle layer here when you take a cross section from the tube. What I would want to say that uh, there is a uh, here is the inner one, inner layer, and this is the middle one, mantle layer, and marginal layer outside. So cells from mantle layers, you see these cells will migrate to the outside to create the cerebral cortex, right? But there are a couple of cells will stay, or groups of cells stay inside the mantle cells in the white matter. These will create the corpus striatum or something related to the basal ganglia not just the because you have substantia niagara and so forth so these ag ag uh, um, aggregation of group of neurons in the white matter we call it nuclei some of these nuclei we call them basal ganglia and examples the corpus striatum you see here cardiac nucleus and lentiform uh, nucleus so back again to the cerebral hemisphere and by the end of the third month if you have a look to the brain to the cerebral hemisphere you will see it like smooth mainly smooth but this will not last for a long time because after a month you will start a kind of the gray matter will start to grow fast than the white matter and you will start to see this kind of zigzag like zigzag line or um, a kind of gyri and sulci, right? So you start to see the features of the gyri and sulci by the fourth um, month. And you know, this is um, increase the surface area of the brain in a small space. So anyway, the, the, the shape or the um, uh, merely the detailed pattern of gyri and sulci is like... Um, different from individual to another now 
Yes, we mentioned that this is the um, uh, cerebral or the primordium of cerebral hemisphere on the right and on the left and we mentioned the cavitation and you see now the lateral ventricles which is great and the diencephalon here and the third ventricle here you have a lateral ventricle here lateral ventricle here connected to that third ventricle here yes that's fine and we mentioned that the neurons in the material layer will migrate to the cerebral cortex to form to, uh, to the surface to the marginal layer to form the cerebral cortex Yes, but we mentioned there are a couple of groups of neurons will stay there, right, in the mantle layer, creating the um, basal ganglia, for example, corpus striatum, right, the nuclei inside the white matter. Now, yes, that's fine, excellent, but uh, do you think they will stay, because, you know, corpus striatum represent the cardiac nucleus and lintiform nucleus. How the two nuclei divided from each other. Yes, we mentioned that the cerebral cortex started because there's cell bodies in the cerebral cortex and so forth, start to grow and they have axons. Their axons will create a kind of pathways that will go toward the other structures and the spinal cord and so forth. So these axons create a kind of internal capsule internal capsule fiber pathway right called internal capsule that divides the corpus striatum into cardiac nucleus and medially and uh, lintiform nucleus laterally which is like a lens shape well that's why called lintiform nucleus now we know now how is the cerebral cortex, cardiac nucleus, lentiform nucleus, internal capsule, ventricles created. Uh, further expansion of the cerebral uh, hemisphere, the cerebral hemisphere starts to take like an S shape as you see here, but not just the cerebral hemisphere, but also the lateral ventricle inside it. Look at it, it follows that uh, curve. And also the cardiac nucleus. If you look at the cardiac nucleus, you will see that at the first, I will use this color, the first, the cardiac nucleus was the form, it, uh, at the end of the day, it follows the, um, the curve of the lateral ventricle. But more details, like for example, the cardiac nucleus here, uh, it uh, creates a kind of the floor of the lateral ventricle, then it becomes like the roof of the lateral um, uh, ventricle. Here, here is it here, the floor of the cardiac nucleus forms the uh, floor of the lateral ventricle. Because this is a lateral ventricle, right? So it becomes it uh, it forms the uh, floor. Then once it curves, then it becomes like the roof of the, this is a lateral ventricle. So it's the roof of the lateral ventricle. So the idea that's that the ventricles and cardiac nucleus and so forth they follow the uh, development of the cerebral hemispheres. So. Yes, we mentioned that there is a rapid, uh, really, uh, development of the um, uh, cortex, and that's obviously shown before a couple of slides, but there is one thing, my friends. Here is the frontal, parietal, occipital, but the occipital also, occipital lobe, um, uh, uh, grows fast. And all of these gyri, parts of the brain, grow faster than this area, which is close to the diencephalon. If you remove it, this is the insula. Anyway, if you remove it here, if you remove it, you will get to the um, uh, uh, corpus striatum, right? You will get here to the corpus striatum if you remove it here. This is the lateral sulcus, right? Or lateral fissure. This is the lateral fissure. However, how is it created? How is the insula here created? You know that the occipital um, lobe, especially, and the other part of the gyri, they grow very fast, faster than this area that covers the diencephalon. That's why it the occipital lobe creates something because it tries to find a way to grow. So there is no way to grow to the back except going forward, creating the temporal lobe. So, the temporal lobe from here, and the right and uh, frontal lobe from the above, creating a kind of this um, lateral sulcus and hidden this part of the brain called insula. Another part of 
um, footprint or prosencephalone, which is the diencephalon. And uh, no need to remind you that the again prosencephalon, the prime one of the primary vesicles here, gives the telencephalon that gives the tissue hemispheres, and it gives also the diencephalon. And the diencephalon, you know, it will give the uh, these structures very important, like thalamus, hypothalamus, you know, I'm trying to select whatever familiar to you first, thalamus, hypothalamus, pineal body, and pituitary gland, plus very important structure, which is the optic cup and stock. In the eye, we'll talk more about that. So you have to know that uh, structure in the eye formed from the optic cup that's originated from diencephalon that means the eyes are a mirror to the brain now the as you know that the diencephalon it's in the middle it becomes between the two cerebral hemispheres and let me erase this and of course um uh it composed if you look to the diencephalon, which is not clearly, I will show you. But remember that it has a roof plate and it has alar plate on both sides, but it has no floor or basal plate. Let me show you. So again, this is a lateral, um, or you are looking to the medial side of the uh, diencephalon here is the cerebral hemisphere and if you have a look to the development brain you know that this is cerebral hemisphere and here is the diencephalon including the um, thalamus and hypothalamus and subthalamus and epithalamus and so forth so and there is a roof here which is the roof plate right again in the imperio here this is the um, thalamus and this is the hypothalamus and there is the, that means here's the diencephalon right between the between the two cerebral hemispheres because there's a cerebral hemisphere move down and there is an, another one here we removed it so you look into the middle side of the right um, diencephalon anyway so this is the roof plate in which the roof plate here of course composed from even the muscles will um proliferate to uh form of course with the blood vessels to form the choroid plexus of the third ventricle because you know between the two thalami or in diencephalon here you have the third ventricle right so there is the choroid plexus formed at the roof of the ventricle of the third ventricle from the roof plate of diencephalon just like the, just that no but also if you go posterior or caudally the caudal part of the roof plate thicken here to form uh, the pineal uh, body this is a pineal thickening back again here look at the roof plate that's form that forms the choroidal bluxus in the roof of third ventricle is the third ventricle anyway and posterior or caudally it forms the pineal body or we call it epiphysis. Again, um, we mentioned that the diencephalon not just form the choroidal plexus and pineal body, also it forms uh, the um, uh, thalamus and hypothalamus, and in between there's a kind of a sulcus that will stay even in the adult, which is the we call it hypothalamic sulcus. This is the hypothalamic sulcus that you know um, uh, form a kind of a natural border between the thalamus up and the hypothalamus inferior and uh, ventrally. So this is the hypothalamic region and this is the thalamic uh, region. Now that was about the prosencephalon with telencephalon and diencephalon. Now let us move a little bit inferiorly and shift to the um, uh, first part in the brainstem which is the midbrain or mesencephalon and we mentioned that this is very easy part because the midbrain the primary physical uh, uh, of the midbrain or mesencephalon will not give a secondary um, uh, divisions it will stay the same midbrain will stay the midbrain right so and if you take a cross section look again here so this is a uh, prosencephalon and this is mesencephalon and this is the 
uh, uh, rump encephalon or the hind brain. Anyway, if you take a section of the uh, midbrain, which is of course part of the neural tube, you will find that it has a kind of two plates, one anterior, which is a red color, we call it basal plate, and you have posterior alar plates. But what's the plates? Indeed, they are, uh, if you look at it, it's a kind of aggregation of motor neurons here in the basal plate, right? And during the differentiation, these uh, neurons will group, right? In which this is the final structure of the cross-section of adult midbrain, right? These motor, new, these um, ba the basal plate, the neurons there, aggregate to form two groups, which is very clear here. Somatic efferent neurons and visceral efferent neurons. So, somatic efferent from its name somatic that means to muscle of course when you talk about the development of the brain mainly you have to remember structures in the head and neck don't think too much except you know in the vagus nerve but forget now so think about the head and neck just right and cranial nerves so somatic efferent in the midbrain you know from the gross anatomy that there are two nerves there, right? Number three and four, oculomotor and trochlear nerve. So this is a kind of the nuclei would be the nuclei for um, oculomotor and trochlear nerve. And we have posterior and lateral to it, another group of neurons, which is um, uh, parasympathetic nucleus, right? For parasympathetic nucleus for what? For innervating the um, iris sphincter uh, muscle and ciliary muscle for the pupil dilation and constriction when you look to the light or you went you go to the dark right like the region of the pupil or constriction or something like that so the reflex comes from here here is a nucleus uh, known as edinger westphal uh, nucleus so this is the uh, two nuclei in the mid um, brain so, uh, of course, when you say visceral, that means this is out of your control. Somatic, something related um, to mainly to uh, voluntary uh, uh, structures, mainly, right? So, this is about the basal uh, plate. But if you look here, you see there is a marginal area with a rose. This marginal area um, uh, of uh, basal plate will enlarge to form the uh, cross cerebri. You know, in the midbrain, you have a cross cerebri anteriorly here, pathways for fibers, right? This is the cross cerebri formed from the, this area, marginal area right enlarged and moved forward now let me erase these things now that was about the uh, uh, basal plate but what about the neurons in the back forming the alar plate the alar plate will differentiate my friends and they form a kind of if you look at it here Look, they create a kind of longitudinal nuclei. These longitudinal nuclei called colliculus. Again, if you go to the gross uh, um, uh, morphology of the brain and look to the midbrain from the back, you will see you have superior colliculus and inferior colliculus or colliculi, right? Those in the back of midbrain here, right? So at the first, there was a longitudinal column, right? As you see here, separated by longitudinal fissure. So you have on the right and on the left. But with further development, these colloculi divided by transverse groove. So that means you have two superior colloculi and two inferior colloculi, which is, you know, 
they uh, have function related to the, uh, for example, the superior colleges to moving the eye and um, to, to moving the eye and, and neck toward the stimuli. Somebody like yellow knee or so, you have to move your head there or and also the inferior colleges, they have a connection from the eye and ear responding to the sound, moving your head and neck to the um, uh, sound there. To the last part of the brain stem, which is the rhomboencephalon or the hind brain, that um, gives the origin of, as you see here, to the pons, cerebellum, and medulla oblongata. Through, of course, the secondary vesicles, they are metencephalon and myelencephalon. Metencephalon and myelencephalon. M, M. Remember that. So, where is the rhomboencephalon or the hindbrain? So again, you know, this is the mesencephalon, the midbrain. So here is the start of the rhomboencephalon. We call the rhomboencephalic isthmus. So, as you know, it gives two secondary vesicles, uh, metencephalon and myelencephalon. So, the uh, metencephalon started from romp, um, uh, rhomboencephalic isthmus until it reached to the pontine flexure. So, this part. So, this is the metencephalon but myelencephalon from pontine flexure to the uh, until you reach the um, spinal uh, cord right this is the most color part of the brain uh, physical so now you have an idea now that the metencephalon will give the pons and cerebellum and the cavity there will be the upper part of the fourth ventricle that you see here. Now, uh, let us start with the uh, now with the metencephalon. That of course will be close to the myelencephalon, caudal to it. They have of course basal and again alar plates, irrigation of neurons. Now. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, remind you that the metencephalon gives the cerebellum, it gives the cerebellum and the uh, pons, and let us start with the basal plate. This one, the anterior one. This is again a cross section of the pons. So remember the pons of the adult. You remember there is pontine nuclei. There is you when you say bones that means what comes to your mind is cranial nerve number five, number six, number seven, and kind of number eight and so. So this is what comes to your mind. Let us keep these in our mind. And you have to uh, I think maybe in the next lectures you will get idea about the function of each nerve with either mixed motor uh, with the motor or mixed motor and sensory anyway. So the basal blade, let us start from the midline. There is one way to remember the names of uh, uh, these uh, groups of neurons. If you remember in the um, uh, uh, midbrain, we have the somatic efferent, right? You have the somatic efferent, which is uh, wa, that was, of course, the region for nuclei of canal nerve number three and four, right? So remember that the somatic efferent will extend from the midbrain above to the pons to the middle oblongata. It's like a column, right? So it exists in all of them. These are motor columns. We call it the somatic efferent motor column, right? And similarly, also the special visceral efferent, general visceral efferent. So, look the efferent. When you say again efferent, I'm trying to make it easier for you to uh, to remember it. Um, so, somatic, somatic because it supplies the um, here's the skeletal muscle efferent because different that because the motor neurons carry signals from the central nervous system to that muscle right so we call it efferent carrying away from the central nervous system if um, that's e a afferent which is the sensation 
carry the sensation to the central nervous system. Anyway, so this is somatic efferent, in which which cranial nerve will be here to somatic. It will be cranial nerve number the nuclei of cranial nerve number six. And if you remember from the brainstem of adult, the uh, uh, Abducent nerve, cranial nerve number six, um, comes out close to the midline here from these nuclei. So it's good to know, remember. Now, what else we have? Group of neuron, efferent neurons. We have a special visceral. Always there is this arrangement: somatic efferent in the middle, lateral to it, special visceral, lateral to it, general visceral. But in the sensory, no, it's opposite. If this is the somatic efferent, this is somatic afferent. This is a special visceral efferent. This is a special visceral afferent. This is general visceral efferent. This is general visceral afferent. Right? So they are arranged in this way. Right? So it's easier to remember. You start somatic efferent from the close to the middle, but somatic afferent. At the per mostly at the periphery, right? At the most periphery. Once you close to the midline, then um, special visceral, special visceral, general visceral, general visceral, either motor or sensory. Erase them again. Okay. So the special visceral uh, afferent, which is the nuclei for cranial nerve number five and seven, which is radiomular nerve and facial nerve. When you say special visceral, efferent special visceral efferent you have to know that this term related to supply because efferent that means supply mainly muscles but which muscles in the head and neck muscles supplied visceral be supplied um, uh, by uh, uh, the supply the muscles originated by pharyngeal arch so special visceral Efferent for, for example, a trigeminal um, uh, nerve would be, of course, for muscle of mastication. You can say um, uh, uh, mylohyoid, anterior periphery, gastric, and so forth. And the special visceral efferent for facial nerve would be, I think, what you remember first is the facial expression uh, muscle, right? And of course, uh, posterior periphery, gastric and the stabilis muscle in the ear and so forth. So these muscles originate um, or are created by pharyngeal arch in the hedonic. Now, general visceral efferent usually uh, would be here, for example, if you talk about the facial nerve would be to the uh, submandibular and sublingual glands plus to the lacrimal glands, right? Before uh, shifting to the um, alar plate, let me remind you that in the midbrain, that the marginal layer of basal plate, the marginal layer of basal plate formed in the midbrain, of course, the cross cerebri. If you remember now, here, guys, you are in the pounds, so the marginal layer of basal plate thicken here to form an area that's good for pathways and axons to pass from the brain to the other parts of the brain stem and spinal cord. There, so there's a pathway for uh, uh, for axons, right? So, but somebody can say, yes, there is a kind of something there. In that area, which is pontine nuclei. So these nuclei originate from the alar plate and moved forward, right? So, yes, alar plate, that means similar to the, um, uh, here is uh, uh, in the midbrain, uh, similar to the midbrain, similar to the medulla blanca or myelencephalon, you have an alar plate here, which is a group of neurons, which is, as I mentioned earlier, if this is somatic efferent, so the sensation will be here on the other side, will be somatic afferent, which is in this case, as I mentioned, then when you say pounds, that means the crane near number five, um, six, seven, and eight. However, the somatic afferent will be carry sensation from the face, which is through cranial nerve number, uh, five. Now, uh, general um, 
uh, here also the if there is here a special visceral here is a special uh, visceral afferent special that means something related to the taste and you know that the facial nerve carries the sensation or the taste sensation from anterior to third of the tongue and general visceral afferent here also can be the uh, not the taste can be here is the sensation also from anterior to third of the tongue through the cranial nerve number five so these uh, uh, group of neurons mainly um, in the um, alar plate of metencephalon. Now, cerebellum, yes, we said that the, um, let me remind you here, that the metencephalon gives bones and cerebellum. Now, let us talk about the cerebellum. So, the cerebellum, uh, my friend, uh, uh, originates from the dorsal part of the alar plate right here is you look into the posterior uh, posteriorly to the metencephalon and myelencephalon and you can see if there is a, a basal plate you remember the cross section basal plate and alar plate so here's you see the basal plate now and also you see the alar plate and also you see the roof here alar the uh, roof plate here so um, the cerebellum originates from the dorsal part of alar plate right that means if you go here you see this rhombic limb rhombic limb here again this is the alar plate here alar plate here and so this area which is like an a twisted area here which would be the um, uh, which is the dorsal part of the alar plate so this area will be for the origin of cerebellum right so uh, now the rhombic uh, limb that you see here let me erase it here so this area the rhombic limb here will twisted and bend to uh, join uh, uh, each other, I would say, and form the cerebellar plate. Where is the cerebellar plate? Here is, guys, again, the rhombic lip here, and this is the, rhomp the rhombic limb here. So once they join each other, they will form something called cerebellar plate this is the cerebellar you look into the cerebellar a plate now you remember that uh, there is a kind of uh, the roof here right you remember let me show you here you have a roof plate here so when they approximate each other the rhombic limb you get this view from the back but this will be di this space will be the dimension like this then like this like when you make like a pressure on against each other so you will get this view now the uh, what you get here cerebral uh, cerebellar hemisphere here cerebellar hemisphere here vermis in the middle and you get nodule here and flocculus here and in between there is a a, a fissure you see here a transverse fissure that's shown here let me erase these things again yes so the fissure here uh, which is uh, indeed the transverse fissure separates the nodule here from the vermis and also separates the flocculus from the cerebellar hemisphere of course on the right and on the left and uh, uh, this I would say lobe that forms from nodule and flocculus we call it floculo nodular lobe is the most primitive part to form in the cerebellum right so here is the idea of the cerebellum let me uh, summarize it again to you so the cerebellum developed from where developed from dorsal part of alar plate here in an area called 
rhombic lip approximate proliferate and approximate each other and of course the well they approximate each, this is a rhombic uh, rhombic lip here of course they when they proliferate right and of course you have a, a roof plate here so they start to approximate each other until you get this view and then that if you forming cerebral hemispheres vermis uh, nodule and flocculus and those are the first thing to um, form separated of course by transverse uh, fissure now this is extra information if you take a cross section through the um, this cerebellar plate you will get that it has um, three layers mantle layer and this black uh, layer for what we call it the neuroepithelial layer which is important and you have again this marginal layer outside so from the neuroepithelial layer there are kind it creates a kind of neurons that will migrate to the marginal layer right it creating this layer which is external granular external granular layer now um, from the external granular layer uh, in the six month of development i would use this now neurons from external granular layer now they are ready i'll use another color i will use the red color sorry so they are ready now to um i would say uh to export neurons beyond the Purkinje cells because look at the development here yes we have a neuroepithelial layer neuroepithelial gives like neurons to form the external granular layer and also you have Purkinje cells don't forget that now again the external granular layer now will export neurons back deep to the Purkinje cells like this right in this direction you see the arrow here Yes, in that in this direction to get this view now the neurons from external granular layer are now distributed even deep to the Purkinje cells uh, here right so also if you look to this figure you remember again this neuroepithelial layer that gives the neurons forming the cerebellar cortex with its neurons but also there is a group of neurons still close to it there in which a nuclei inside the cerebellum that's known as for example dentate nucleus this is an example of nuclei formed there and there are still like basket and stellate cells are produced by proliferation of cells in the cerebellar white uh, matter no now you have a cerebellar cortex with um, layers formed by Purkinje cells, Golgi type 2 neurons, and the neurons produced, as I mentioned, by external granular layer that reach, of course, um, its definitive size after birth. Now, the last part is the myelencephalon. Cephalon, it's uh, close to the idea of. Um, uh, metencephalon up however the myelencephalon it gives the middle oblongata which is the last um, uh, part of rhombencephalon and uh, uh, again if you take a cross section from the myelencephalon you will see that it also has a basal plate and alar plate in between there's a kind of a clear sulcus called sulcus limitans sulcus limitans so let us start with the uh, basal plate. Somebody can say what these. This is a cross section of midbrain. This is a cross section of pons. And now we we talk about myelencephalon. That means you talk about middle oblongata. But I put this why? Because in the myelencephalon that gives the um, uh, the myelencephalon that gives the middle oblongata. Also yes. Let us start with the 
basal plate also it has somatic efferent and I mentioned the somatic efferent before a couple of slides I mentioned that that it forms like it exists in the middle of Langata it exists here in the uh, 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 bones it exists in the midbrain here in the midbrain it's the um, it's the location for nuclei of nerve number three and four and in the bones it's a nuclei of number six and in the middle of Langata, it's for number cranial nerve uh, number 12. So it creates a kind of column, right? So uh, here, my friend, is the... I'll use the scalar. So let us start again. You have a group of neurons in the basal um, uh, uh, plate. So you have the somatic uh, efferent, most medially, which that contains the nuclei of cranial nerve number 12, which that supplies all the uh, muscles of the tongue except glossus. Somatic again, something related to your body. Now again, uh, posterior lateral to it, we have special visceral efferent. And I told you before a couple of slides that when you say special visceral efferent, remember the muscle created by pharyngeal arch. That means when you say also mid medulla oblongata, you remember cranial nerves um, number uh, 9, 10, 11, 12. So it becomes now easier to understand. So now special visceral efferent, special visceral efferent this word related to the muscles striated muscles created by pharyngeal arch and in the head i think you remember that number nine it gives the uh glossopharyngeal uh, muscle and number um uh, number 10 here guys uh will give the uh, uh muscles which is related to constrictor muscle of the um, pharynx and intrinsic muscle of larynx and part from the um, upper part or upper two-third of the esophagus, right? And here, cranial nerve number 11, um, uh, sternocleidomastoid and trabezius um, muscle. So this is a special visceral efferent. Now, general visceral efferent here is the location of the general visceral um, uh, efferent which is related efferent to the glands usually and secretion for example you know number nine related to parotid gland and tin also related uh, to secretions in the um, uh, respiratory tract uh, esophagus um, uh, digestive tract, I mean trachea, bronchi, and heart, right? So this is about these uh, nuclei. Um, we mentioned all of these things, and uh, yes. So now, posteriorly, the you have the alar plate. So start with the most lateral posterior one which is somatic afferent because you know it carries the uh it's the location for carrying the sensation uh like pain temperature touch and pressure um from the um, pharynx by glossopharyngeal nerve right and you have i would say here and you have again the special uh, visceral afferent which is when you say special afferent, that means special afferent, not special visceral efferent. When you say special visceral efferent, that means muscles, rated muscles by pharyngeal uh, arts. But special visceral afferent, that means sometimes taste and hearing, right? Because this is the location, you know, um, of taste, because, you know, the posterior one-third of the tongue, uh, the taste from posterior one third of the tongue curved by glossopharyngeal uh, nerve and taste from uh, palate and glottis also uh, by cranial nerve number um, um, 10, vagus nerve, right? And here is, guys, the general um, visceral 
efferent, which is uh, that carry in here because from its name general, right? So it's aware, you have to be aware from the interoceptive information from the, for example, respiratory gas because you have cranial number, vagus nerve that goes, the only cranial nerve that goes to the thorax and abdomen. So you are aware if you are full, you are hungry, and uh, you are aware of the stretch, if your lungs are stretched and full during inspiration, for example. So this is come something called interoceptive information, right? That means sense of the internal state of your body, right? So, so we finished the uh, most of the basal plate and alar plate, but you know you have a roof plate, which is uh, a kind of uh, ebendimal cells covered by pia um, matter, and once the vessels there, they create a kind of choroid plexus of the um, uh, uh, choroid plexus of the fourth. Um, ventricle. Here's uh, finally, uh, let us uh, take a couple of examples about congenital anomalies of the brain and the most common one, which is the, although it's rare, but um, that's well known, anencephaly or uh, myroencephaly. Anencephaly, it occurs if you remember the neuronal, uh, the uh, neural tube, my friend, and it has rostral neuropore and colon neuropore so failure of closure of the rostral neuropore will uh, at the during the fourth week will lead to uh, absence of the brain physicals that means you will have you, you the, the 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 child or newborn has no for a brain or mid brain or most of the hind uh, brain and also mainly the calvaria also absent so look at it here there is no cover for the skull there is no cerebral hemispheres or midbrain or even um, the parts of hind brain below I mean pause M11 and Gata um, this is again because of the failure of closure of the rostral, rostral neural pore of a neural tube which is very important now another and uh, congenital anomaly is the microcephal from its name micro that means not just the head but also the head i mean the skull and the brain they have they are smaller than normal and um, indeed, the infants that usually um, has the microcephaly, they have a kind of, they are severely mentally challenged because of under, the brain is underdeveloped, right? But look, the face size is like the same. There is no change, right? Face is, uh, face is of normal size. And... Which is this one, which is the congenital hydrocephalus? You know that you have ventricles inside the brain, lateral ventricles, there are ventricle and four ventricle, and there is a production of the CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. So, accumulation of the, 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 the CSF should be produced and drained at the same rate. So, if there is overproduction or um, there is a kind of uh, impairment uh, of the circulation, impairment of the circulation of the CSF inside the brain, the subarachnoid space and spinal cord, or there is a abnormal absorption because it should be produced and absorbed outside the um, brain and spinal cord cavities there should be at the same rate, right? If there is any um, uh, impairment of any of these this will be uh, this will lead to accumulation of CSF and one of the causes uh, my friend one of the causes of uh, impaired of circulation of CSF you remember the lateral ventricles that drain into third ventricle and then through cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle sometimes there is usually there is uh, congenital stenosis here in the cerebral aqueduct called congenital aqueductal stenosis so it's it, it's like narrow so the 
there is not you don't have the or the child don't have a normal flow of CSF right so thank you and uh, see you in the next lecture